Good evening and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Minister Inez Williams, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you to Global Apostolic Movement Virtual Church Service on Sunday night, also known as CAM. I would like to welcome those that are here tuning in for the first time and tell you that we think it not robbery, nor do we take it for granted that you have stopped what you're doing out of your busy day to join us at Global Apostolic Movement. And those that have been here in the past, we wanna tell you welcome family and welcome friends. My name once again is Minister Inez Williams, and I'm taking this opportunity to personally thank each and every one of you and to welcome you to Global Apostolic Movement Virtual Church Service. We are here every Sunday night at 7 p.m. We are on Zoom and also on Facebook Live. We are under the leadership of our very own Chief Apostle LaShawn Rees and our presiding pastor, Pastor Beverly Cole. I would like to take this opportunity to tell you guys that you are in for a treat on tonight. Um, Donnie McClurk is saying a song that said, I came for deliverance and deliverance is what I received. But I don't know about you tonight, saints of God, but I came for a word of God and the word of God is what I intend to receive on tonight. Pastor Beverly Koshi is our presiding pastor over Global Apostolic Movement. And let me tell you something, saints and friends and family of God. This woman here walks and talks and preaches the word of God like nobody I've ever seen. We thank God for God allowing her to be used as his vessel. We thank God for her being obedient to the word of God and coming forth, giving us the word of God, just like God has gave it to her. We thank God for each and every one of you. And once again, I thank God for my... Chief Apostle, Apostle LaShawn Reese and her husband. And I thank God for everyone that tuned in and everyone that is associated or participating with Global Apostolic Movement. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And now for our opening prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, glory to God, Father, we come before the throne of grace, before the mercy seat, God. Thank you again, God, for one more day to praise your name, God. One more day to lift you up, God, and one more day to glorify you, God. Father God, we give you the highest praise on tonight, which is hallelujah, God. Father God, I'm asking you on tonight, God. Father God, I'm asking that you prick hearts and prick souls, God. Let your word come forth with plainness and in boldness, God. Father God, I'm asking that you use Pastor Beverly Cole. Use her to the utmost, God. Use her as your vessel, God. And Father God, as you begin to use the woman of God to pour into the people of God, Father God, I'm asking that you restore her strength. I'm asking that you restore her virtue, God. And Father God, I'm asking you on tonight, God, to look down on every man, woman, boy, or girl, God. Huh? Father God, I'm asking that you look down on the homeless and the sick. Look down on the sick and the shuttered and those that are confined behind the prison wall. Father God, I'm asking that you let your word reach the people, God. God. Father God, there's somebody in need, God. There's somebody tonight that's crying out, I yield, I yield, God, that I can hold out no longer. Father God, I'm asking that you save them, sanctify them, and give them the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. Father God, as we prepare for the word of God tonight, God, Father God, I'm going to put out my plate. I'm going to get my fork and my knife and also my spoon, God, but because God, I'm ready to eat the word of God tonight. Last night, I heard a wonderful word about hunger games, hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Father God, we give you praise. We give you honor, God, and we give you the glory. Father God, we tell you, thank you for all that you've done and all that you're getting ready to do. We thank God for the word of God that Pastor Cole delivered on last week, crossing over to take over because the violence suffered not, and we're going to take it back by force. And right now, saints of God, I'm not going to prolong the time. I'm going to bring forth the woman of God to do just what God has instructed, ordained, and has called her to do. We thank God for our very own presiding pastor, Pastor Beverly Cole. It is now in your hands. Be blessed. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. To God be all the glory, to God be all the honor, to God be all the praise. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, I don't know where we would be. I don't even know where I would be. But tonight, I just want to welcome each and every one of you as our minister Inez has so graciously invited and welcome each and every one of you to Game Virtual Church with our presiding uh, pastor. I am Beverly Cole, amen. And I also want to acknowledge our chief apostle, Apostle LaShawn Reese, and of course, her husband, her helpmate. In other words, they are one flesh, past, senior pastor, Odin Reese. And again, thank you all for joining us. And as always, it's always good before we do anything 
Even when you wake up in the morning before you get up and brush your teeth, when you wake up on the side of your bed, if you would just utter, mm, utter out of your lips, God, I thank you. It's something about being grateful. It's something about having gratitude. It elevates the, your attitude. It changes what's going on. The word says that weeping may endure for a night, mm, but joy cometh in the morning. See, that in and of itself ought to make you rejoice. Whatever you went through the day before, whatever you went through, you know, when you laid your head down, can I tell you joy is here? The Lord is just waiting for you to open up your mouth and give him praise. Because see, I'm going to let you in on a secret. It's already done. It's already finished before the foundations of the earth, before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He had already called. He had already sanctified. He had already anointed. He had already appointed you. He'd already written out your story in the beginning. He wrote out the end. In other words, we're playing catch up to what he's already done. So if you can just lay hold of that, if you can just grasp that right now, that it's already settled, victory is mine. If you can just begin to release a roar into the heavenlies, I'm talking about a hallelujah. That's the highest praise. I'm talking about a praise of thanksgiving. If you have to sacrifice, see, sometimes you have to, even when you don't feel like it, because it's something about you praising God that's going to shift the the atmosphere. It's something about praising God uh, that's going to cause the enemy to retreat. Uh, it's something about praising God uh, that's going to release confusion into the enemy's camp. Uh, it's something about praising God uh, that's going to quicken something in you uh, to let you know what? I may have forgotten. Uh, maybe things were coming at me so hard uh, that I didn't remember that the victory is already mine uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, that no matter what I go through, healing is my portion. Uh, no matter what my bills look like, uh, healing and deliverance. He is my provider. He's going to provide for everything I need. So if I can just remember who I am and who he is and just begin to rejoice and just begin to thank him, all of a sudden blessings going to begin to fall out of nowhere because he's going to realize or he's, mm, when you pray, you're getting God's attention. Mm. He already knows your situation, but it's something about you opening up your mouth. You're going to get his attention and he's going to sit down in the midst of your mess. He's going to sit down in the midst of the chaos. He's going to sit down in the midst of the disappointment. He's going to sit down. And when he shows up, everything else got to flee. Sickness have to go. Because the joy of the Lord will begin to strengthen you because he says that he inhabits the praises of his people. I don't know about you, but somebody needs to worship. Somebody needs to praise. Somebody needs to lift up holy hands. Somebody needs to shout. If you can't shout, maybe you just need to clap. Maybe you just need to stump your feet. But I came by to tell you that God is still good. He is still in control. And no matter what, his mercy endures forever. And can I just add one more thing onto it? That his goodness and his mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. I don't know where you are, but if you look around, you see goodness. If you look around long enough, mercy is going to show up. So I just came by to let you know tonight mm, that it's already all right. That's not the topic, but somebody needed to hear that. Because somebody is ringing up out their towel. Somebody is ready to put up the net. Somebody is about ready to throw it in. Somebody is about ready to quit. But I just came by to let you know it ain't over till you win. Because the victory is already yours. The word of God says he always causes us to triumph. If you can just settle your mind on the fact I'm a winner. If you can just settle your mind or wrap your mind around the fact that I'm a champion. Who that God has already fought for me and the victory is mine. And everything I need has already been released to me in the Old and the New Testament. You do understand that's your will. You know, when somebody dies, but I was died and rose again. And he left us a will and testament in the old and the new testament, the promises, our inheritance, our portion, who we are, our adoption, everything that we need has already been given to us. And if you don't read it, if you don't read what has been left over to you, what has been willed to you, what has been set aside and sanctified just for you, then you'll never know what God did or what Jesus did on the cross. Because when we don't understand all of the promises and what he did for us, we're missing out. He's not. He just wants us to, I, I can just hear him, just imagine hearing him saying in heaven, when are they going to wake up? 
When are they just going to open up their mouths? When are they going to receive everything that I died for? When are they going to walk in the Zoe life, the abundant life that I died for? When are they going to understand healing belongs to them? It's already yours in Christ Jesus. And so again, I just want to thank the Lord and shout hallelujah. I'm going to shout and dance for somebody out there who can't or may not be able to see their way. So I just bless God for each and every one of you. And if you will, I'm just going to start out. The topic that God had given me, I'm going to read the scripture verse first, amen? And it's actually coming out of Luke 22, verses 31 through 34. And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. This is a very familiar passage, but it was something in there that God had just quickened in my spirit. And I'm also going to read it from the uh, God's word translation as well. So I'm going to read them out of two different versions. And the first one is coming out of New Living Translation, Luke 22, 31 through 34. And it reads, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like we, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented, and return to me again. Strengthen your brothers. Verse 33, Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. Verse 34 reads, but Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. That's that's just a rough statement right there, all of that. And, and, and I just bless God. I don't want to start breaking it down, but I want to read the other one out of the God's word translation. And it reads 31, starting with 31. Then the Lord says, Simon, Simon, listen. Some of you, this is for you. You may want to put your name in there, but I'm going to say, Beverly, Beverly, listen. Satan has demanded to have you and it says here, in this one, it says apostles for himself. He wants to separate you from me as a former separates wheat from husk. 32, but I have prayed for you. You do understand that Jesus is our chief intercessor, right? He said, but I have prayed for you, Beverly, that your faith will not fail. So when you recover, mm, strengthen the other disciples or the others that you have come in contact with. That's just me. Verse 33 reads, but Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and to die with you. How many of you have felt that strong about your faith? I can take anything I'm gonna go through. I'm not gonna falter. I'm not gonna faint because I love the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my soul and with all of my mind, with all of my might, with all of my strength. I've surrendered everything. I've left everything. I laid aside everything. And it comes to this point right here when he says, but Satan has pleaded. He has demanded, he has asked if I can sift you as wheat. But Jesus didn't stop it. But instead, he gave him a warning. He just let him know that don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Don't worry about it. When you go through, keep that word in mind, when you go through. <laughs> but hold on, because I have prayed. Verse 34 says, Jesus replied, Peter, I can guarantee that the rooster won't crow tonight until you have three times denied knowing me, amen? And that's how it is sometimes. Sometimes we get so hard pressed on every side. To, it's not our intentions to deny the father. But when things come at us, I like to call them even being blindsided because if you knew they were coming and some things we should know, but they come in such an odd way. They come in such an odd time to where I believe we become oblivious. <laughs> that is the only word that came to mind, that we have to go through a testing of our faith. And so the topic, if I have to have one, sifting comes before shifting. Hmm. Sifting comes before the shifting. And so when I looked up the word sift, sift means an act of sifting something. It means to isolate, 
uh, something that is important from something that is useless or useful. In other words, if you can just get this picture in, in your mind, you remember when the miners would go out, they would be mining for gold and they may be on the side of the, the mountain coming down or maybe even going through a brook or uh, just someplace to where the waters weren't that rough or harsh. And they would take out these sifting pans, if you would call them, and they would stick them under the water and whatever they grab up, they would begin to just shake it, shake it. And everything that wasn't gold began to fall off, even the mud. And they said that the shaking, if you would look at it, it was like a fierceness and, it, and they kept doing it. And whenever they would see the gold, they would remove the gold and they'd stick it back in. That's what sifting does. And instead of God looking for the gold, the sifting that is desired or designed by what the enemy is doing, it's bringing out the impurities of our hearts. It's bringing out the pride that's in us that we don't even know anything about. It's bringing out the ugliness so that God can begin to see. He already knows there's usefulness in us, but he also knows that there are some things that he did not put in us. He also knows there were habits that we learned. There were behaviors and habits that aren't pleasing to him. But instead of throwing us away like so many of us do when we don't see in our husbands what we want or our wives or maybe in our children we have the habit of friends or maybe even churches and pastors we have the ability to just push them aside we're going to put them away because they don't they don't look like what i think they ought to i don't see all of the goodness that god does but can i say i thank god that he didn't throw me away even at my lowest point but he allowed the sifting to go forth because he said that if i can just get it out if I can just continue to sip, continue to shake, continue to remove all of the husk, all of the deadness from her, if I can just continue to mm, sip it, then she'll be ready for the move. She'll be ready for the shifting. She'll be ready to walk into what I have called her to walk into. And I'm not going to have to worry about the impurities. I'm not going to be too mindful or caring about the pride because see, that comes out in the sifting. And it says that to sift, it means to take out residue, remove impurities. And even in the sifting, it has a way of purifying, amen. And so when we're looking at all of this, can you imagine Peter's face? Because see, I wanna give you some examples as to why I believe that Satan wanted to target Peter. We already know that he had asked God for Job because the Lord asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm going throughout the earth. And he was just looking. He's just looking. And Peter had talked about how he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But in this particular passage, in uh, Luke 22, it talked about the Passover. It talked about them preparing for the crucifixion, although they didn't understand the disciples exactly what he was saying. But he was trying to tell them. But I believe he targeted Peter because Peter had a zeal. I believe he targeted Peter because no matter what Jesus had said, Peter was already ready to jump up and to move. Uh, and so when I looked up the word zeal, zeal means to have, mm, help me Holy Ghost, let me just break out zeal for you. When I looked at Peter, because I'm going to give you some examples of Peter and why I believe that Satan had him targeted for some things. When I looked up the word zeal, it means great energy or enthusiasm. In pursuit of a cause. How many know? How many times did Peter basically raise his hand? How many times did Peter automatically open his mouth? How many times did Peter move outside of what everybody else was doing? I'm talking about the disciples. He saw what who Jesus was. He knew who he was. And he just wanted to be like him. So in this verse, when he says, he said, no, I'll be willing to go to prison for you. I would be even willing to die for you. Peter was so zealous for the Lord. He had that passion. And when I looked up the meaning in the Bible, it says a burning desire mm, to please God, to do his will and to advance his glory in the world in every possible way. A person with zeal is said to be enthusiastic, mm, energetic, have, it's eager, it's fervent, it's intense, mm, it's warm. See, all of these, if you will just look at the characteristic of Peter, when he can you imagine, here he is now, after he's they've had supper, after they're getting ready to move on, and Satan 
and Satan asked for Peter. And Jesus says, Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. In other words, I'm going to allow it. Because, see, I know there's some pride in you. I'm going to allow it because, see, your zeal is unharnessed. I'm going to allow it. Because, see, I've got a better cause for you to do. He has restrictions. He has limitations. But I need some of this stuff to come out of you. And when you come back, when you return, when you come back to yourself, I know it's going to be a trying time. I know you may want to throw in the towel. I know that in the midst of this sifting. It's going to be uncomfortable. You might feel some pains. You might feel a little rejection. You may feel a little abandoned. You may begin to wonder if your faith's strong enough. But Jesus told him, I pray that your faith will not fail you. In other words, no matter what you go through, when you come back, you got to strengthen the others because I have a plan for you. When you come back, I know you're going to pull away for a little bit, but I'm still right here. I know it's going to cause you to wonder, but I'm still right here. And so no matter what goes on, you will not go out. You will not lose your faith. You will not walk away, but you are going to be used by me in such a mighty way. I need for you to understand, Peter, that the sifting comes before the shifting. I got a plan. I got a plan for you. I got a plan for you, Peter. I got a plan for you, Beverly. I got a plan for those that are out mm, that are listening under the sound of my voice. I have a plan. And I know the sifting is getting a little hard. I know the sifting hurts. I know it's causing you to wonder who you are. But the Lord said, but can I do it? Because I've got another place I need for you to go to. The word sift in the Greek is Sinizo, I'm going to spell it for you. It's S-I-N-I-A-Z-O. And it means to shake in a sieve. And when you look at the wheat, it also separates the shaft. It separates the stuff from the wheat so that it will just be the pure wheat that comes forth. And when you look up the word wheat, God has a purpose for everything. And wheat is symbolic of the saints of God. It's symbolic of the, in other words, us, <laughs> the church, the believers, it's symbolic. So when you see that word wheat, just remember that it's symbolic of us. And so as the wheat begins to grow, you remember the story about the wheat and the tares. But the Lord says, no, don't, don't pull up the tares because I need for them to grow together. It's something about the tares intermingling under the ground with the root system that get tied up with the wheat. So if you remove it prematurely, you're going to kill my wheat. If you remove it prematurely, they're not going to grow to be who I called them to be because they're so similar and the way they look, but by the time they mature, I'm going to stop right here. This wasn't in my notes, but it's something about seeing the wheat and the tares. If you allow them to mature, the wheat bow down, but the tares stand erect. In other words, the wheat are going to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, whereas the tares are going to stand tall. They're going to be prideful. They're standing as though they will not be moved. They will not be touched. How many of you know people like that? How many of us have felt like that when the Lord has given us instructions instead of bowing down to his word, instead of bowing at his feet, instead of humbling ourselves, we feel like we can go on and on and on. See, that's unharnessed zealousness because the Lord said that I am here. I have sent the Holy Spirit as a guide, as a counselor, as a paraclete. He is to guide you in all truth. But if we won't allow the shifting to finish and allow the testing huh, to have its perfect work. Huh? Woo, hallelujah. Then we're going to go on and we won't be fit for the master's use like he wants us. Because remember, sifting becomes before the shifting. In other words, shift means to move from one place to another. Huh? Can I say, mm, as you are being sifted, there's an elevation that's going to come from it. Amen. It's a change in position. It's a change in culture. It's a change in mindset. It's a change in attitude. It's a change in how you walk. It's a change in how you talk. Once he completes the shifting process, now you're going to know who he is, even in a greater light. It's all about the sifting. Some of you are being sifted right now, but can I tell you, Jesus has already prayed for you that your faith, faith don't fail. This is the good fight that we fight with our faith. I'm going to stand and see what the end is going to be. 
because I know he's already got me wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up. I know that nothing is going to be able to defeat me because in him I have victory. In him I have peace. In him he is a fortress. He is a strong tower. In him I have everything that I need. In Christ Jesus, whoo, hallelujah, everything in him. It says that everything has been placed underneath his feet. I'm safe in the ark of his arms. I'm safe. You are safe. So don't, can I tell you, it's hard to embrace the shifting. That's what he told me. I had to embrace it because it was going to bring a far greater work. I had to embrace it. It didn't feel good. I couldn't see myself doing it at first. But when he began to explain to me, he began to show me that I'm going to have a greater understanding of who he is. He I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be strengthened even the more, so much more that I can go back and begin to give my testimony to somebody else. And for those that are behind me, I have the ability now to pull them out of darkness because I went through the sifting. For my family line, I'm able to break curses because I went through the sifting. As a teacher, I can teach revelational knowledge because I went through the sifting. As a woman of God, I can stand firm knowing that no matter what, no evil shall come nigh my dwelling. I can stand stand in Christ. In him, I live and move and have my being. After the sifting, I'm going to see the gold that's in me, even though I don't see it right now. But because he said it, I'm a believer. So embrace the sifting, even with tears in your eyes. But don't stop. Don't. Ooh. You know, we talk about being in the fire and baking cakes. Don't get out of the oven too soon. He's not done yet. And I believe also that the enemy began to target Peter because that hour in one of the old other versions, it means all of them, it meant the disciples. But when he got very specific and he called out Peter, see, I believe as the enemy was going back and forth, he remembers seeing Peter. I'm talking about this zealous one. I'm talking about this enthusiastic one. I'm talking about the one that said, I'll die for you, Lord. No matter what, I'm going to be right there by your side. If you're walking on water, bid me to come. I'm going to walk with you. I believe during that time that as the enemy was moving back, and forth. He saw Peter sitting in the boat with all of the other disciples, and he wasn't too moved by them because, see, nobody cried out to the vision or to the shadow that was coming across the water. They just sat back. We all know the story about Jesus walking on water, and I'm going to read it mm. out of the Message Bible, amen, mm. and it says here that Peter suddenly bold said, now, see, this is that energetic. This is that enthusiastic. This is the zealous Peter with boldness in his voice. He said, Master, hallelujah, if it's really you called me to come to you on the water. See, he could have asked him for anything else. We're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. We're talking about Elohim, but we're talking about the incarnate Christ. He could have asked for anything, but Peter was just zealous enough and he loved him enough to say, no matter how I got to get to you, Lord, if you would just call for me, if it is you, call my name and I'm going to come running on the water. And he said, come ahead. Mm. How many of you had heard a voice that was coming to you on the mm, on top of the waters, but you didn't think you could get out of the boat because nobody else made mention, nobody else moved? See, there was not any I believed in that boat. I know they loved him. I'm not talking about love. I'm talking about the zeal. I'm talking about the energy. I'm talking about the enthusiasm. I'm talking about the fervor to get out of the boat. Jesus, wherever you are, bid me to come and I'll come to you. If it means me walking on water, but it says that when he got out, we all know the story, that he began to see the winds. And mm, in the Message Bible, it says, but when he looked down at the waves, mm, churning beneath his feet, he lost nerve and started to sink. And he cried, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. It says he reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, faint heart, what got into you? In other words, you were bold enough to get on the water. You were bold enough to step out. You were walking, so what messed you up? Where did your faith go then? 
You said, if I be Jesus to bid you to come. So I called you. Is it because you saw something? Because you took your eyes off of me? Was it because you felt that the bank account, when he told you to start the business, wasn't going to line up? Is it because the pressures of the world begin to... Uh, begin to overtake you. And every time you turn around, if it wasn't this, it was something else. Did you get caught up in the cares of the world? Did you get caught up in listening to all of the propaganda that's being put out of the news? There are some things that are true. But what tripped you up, faint heart? What tripped you up? Mm. A ye of little face, what tripped you up? Didn't you understand that if I called you out and if I allowed you to take five steps, I was going to allow you to see where did your face go? If I called you out and told you to write the business plan, if I called you out and to told you to go look at the house, if I called you out and told you that your marriage is going to be sealed back together and you're going to love each other like never before, where did you doubt? Why did you stop? Why did you get caught up in what the sounds? There was a lot of chatter in the atmosphere, but did I not tell you to come out, come ahead? You asked me for this. He's still in the midst of the sifting. It's getting out, <laughs> Ooh, even the cares of the world. It's, he's shifting out, even depression. Mm. He's shifting because see, some of you have gotten faint hearted because you've been fighting for a long time, but I came to tell you, after the shifting, there is a, after the sifting, there is a shifting. So hold on just a little while longer. I can only imagine that as the enemy was going forth, see, like I said, he targeted Peter. And another reason why I believe he just knew was something about Peter. Now, all of the other disciples, he did not call by name. I want y'all to read that. He didn't call them by name, but he called Peter. He said, that's the one I want because I see a leader in him. That's the one I want because if he ever realized who he is, if I can break him before he gets that promotion, if I can break him right now in the midst of this sifting, I don't have to worry about him because he's the rest of them are just chilled and laid back. Once Jesus goes to the cross, I don't have to worry about them. They're pretty much self-check. But this Peter, Luke 19 and 18, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 19, verse 18 through 25. We all know the story when Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? See, this is just another reason why I believe Satan wanted to target Peter. Because see, everybody else began to say, I'm going to read it. And it says that now it happened as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? Verse 19, and they answered John the Baptist, but the others say Elijah and the others say that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then Jesus asked him this question. He said, now, then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, Peter, it doesn't show in any of the gospels, anybody else spoke up but Peter. And it says, but Peter answered the Christ of God. That's how it reads in the uh, English standard version. And then the other one, it says, thou art the Christ, the Messiah. And he goes on to say, you have said well. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And so in other words, it was as though Peter's spirit was open. Remember, because he had a fervency. He had a passion for God. And so when he asked, who do men say that I am? Peter immediately, that's that zealous one. That's the enthusiastic one. That's the one that will go to the grave. See, whenever you move out or you stand out above the crowd, the enemy is going to desire to sift you. I'm not trying to make you scared. I'm just giving you some, mm, how do I want to say it? I'm just informing you. The word of God says, huh, don't be ignorant of the enemy's devices. And so I'm just letting you know beforehand so you won't get lost in the shuffle or you don't quit in the sifting or you don't try to jump out and run away because you think that God has forsaken you or forgotten you. See, it's something about having a knowledge as to what you're going through so that you can hold on a little bit longer. And remember, even in the midst of the sifting, he says, Jesus said, I've already prayed for you that your faith will not fail you. And it goes on to say, because see, even during the midst of this, 
you remember Jesus told him that he was changing his name and he was calling him Caiaphas, I believe that's how you pronounce it, but it means the rock. And he says, upon the revelation of who I am, the Christ, I will build my church because, and I, I believe at that time, because when you look at a rock, it's like a pillar. He was calling him a pillar. Remember, he still, the enemy desired to sift him, but God had already changed his name. God has already changed some of your names, but you can't see it yet. <laughs> God had already had a plan for you, according to Jeremiah 29 and 11. God had already written your names. He has already plotted your course of life. It is already written in his book. So everything has already been settled and set. But you have to go through the sifting. And see, nobody wants to go through the sifting. But if you can just embrace it, it's not going to last always. And when you come through. And it goes on to say here. And when it says that he is the Messiah, but Jesus warned them, he said, now don't go and tell anybody because he knew that the enemy had a lit, mm, hit list out for him. He just wanted him to just acknowledge and they tried to get everything done in secret so that the people won't get upset because they knew he had a lot of followers. They knew it was something about him. So everything that they plotted to do or designed to do was done in secret so that the people would not see it. Mm. And it goes on and talks about when Jesus began to predict his death. Now I'm talking about the zealous Peter. I'm talking about the sifting before the shifting. Amen. And it goes on and I'm gonna read and Matthew, I pray I'm not losing y'all. I pray I'm not losing y'all. But I need for you to see why the enemy may be coming after you because there is purpose in your life. It's not to deter you. It's not to break you. But God allows it so it will make you in order to be what he is already ordained and called you to be before the foundations of the earth. It didn't start when you were formed in your mother's womb. The word of God says, before I formed you, I foreknew you. In other words, already had your DNA, already had your plan. I've already plotted out your course. So there is nothing that you can do or could have done that I have not already known about and see. So when you come through Peter, strengthen the brethren, because I know the enemy is not going to take you out like that, but it's just for a purpose. And it goes on to say Matthew 16, 20 and 24, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's when Jesus begins to, uh, when Jesus predicts his death and he's talking to Peter. And I want to show you how this thing easily shifts. And it goes on to say, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leaders, leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. If you would just look at that, it wasn't the outsiders that tried to kill Jesus. It wasn't the ones who did not know who he was. They had a, a, a knowledge of him, but see, the elders didn't want them messing with their money. Can, can, can I be a hundred? And that's how it is in the churches, unfortunately. You can know of him, but when he began to mess with the people and the people begin to turn from us and come to you, we got a problem. When they begin to run after you instead of coming to us because you're doing God's work. Now we got a problem because see, they no longer need us because your anointing is showing. So now we have a problem. See, you are teaching wisdom. You're teaching truth. You are turning around everything. See, as long as they were coming to us, we had them bound. As long as they were coming to church, our church, they would only do what we told them to do. As long as they were coming to our church, if they had to call me in the middle of the night to pray for them, I can do it. See, they weren't teaching me how to be myself. They weren't teaching me how to have a relationship with God. They wanted to be the taskmaster. They wanted to be the ones that kept us under lock and key, that made us live by the law instead of under grace. They wanted to hold us back, but the Lord says, I have need of thee. And so 
as they begin to see this movement behind the word, as they begin to see the glory of the Lord begin to heal, to cast out demons, even on days that weren't lawful in their sight, as they begin to see the disciples go about and they're not fasting like they thought, they weren't tithing like they thought, they weren't doing a whole lot of religious acts. See, in this new dispensation of grace, the churches that are not teaching the good news of the gospel, the churches that are not teaching her who hallelujah the kingdom of heaven those churches that are not moving under grace that are not preparing those of people of God, those his sheep, his lambs, if you are not preparing them for what is about to come, then we won't see the end. We won't be standing. We won't be able to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Can I tell you, you're in, you need to be sifted because you're more about your fame. It's more about your words. It's more about your agenda. But can I tell you, the Lord is in the business of sifting and the sifter is coming. This is the season of the sift. He's sifting until your agenda align up with his, until we're able to begin to pray, to decree. See, we were sent here to have dominion. Remember, you crossed over to take over, but you can't take over without being sifted. You can't take over if you don't know what you're working with. You can't take over if you don't have a relationship with Christ. You can't take over if you don't know what your purpose is. That's where the shifting comes in. Because see, somebody told you you were worth nothing. Shift, sift, I'm sorry. Somebody told you that you're not anointed to sift. Somebody told you it wasn't God. He had a plan for your life. And so we're in the season of being sifted. And it goes on to say, in verse 22, it said, but Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. In other words, he began to rebuke him for saying such things. He said, heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen. In other words, they're not going to kill you. You're not going to the cross. Mm -mm. No, I, in other words, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to get in the way. Be careful of those that won't allow you to finish what God has already ordained and called you to finish. Yes, it may be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Can you imagine Peter? This is the one that was enthusiastic. See, I believe, like I said, that God was tempering his zealousness. He didn't want to squash it, but he had to refine it. <laughs> he had to let him know that some things are necessary. Suffering is necessary for you to be shifted to that next level, to that next realm, and to that next dimension. Because there are some things on you can't go with you in this season. But if you allow me to sift it or allow him to sift it, but it's for God's purpose. Don't ever forget that it's for God's purpose. And yes, he can sift you too. It's not just the enemy doing the sifting, but I'm just talking about this because of Peter. And God has the ability, but he did allow it. Remember, he asked because he was watching. The enemy watches, the people are watching. And it's something on you that you don't even have a clue about until you've been sifted. It's something about you that make people look at you strange, that make people wanna keep you on that backside. See, they don't want you taking the glory, but what they forget, number one, the anointing don't belong to you and it don't belong to them. And number two, if we're all in this together, it's about his glory, not man. And so if they can just kill, if they can make you walk away, if they can make the test and the trial so hard, if they can just keep you under lock and key and let you out only when they need you out, to let you out only to draw people to you, just to let you out so and dangle you like a carrot. But can I tell you, God has the sifter out until you begin to know who you are. And so it goes on to say, we all know the story that when, after he rebuked Peter, as a matter of fact, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, because your mindset is from a carnal mindset. It's not for the glory of God. There are some things that people can't see. 
I remember leaving my church because the Lord told me it was time for me to go many years ago. And so I was a teacher, just other things that I did. And I remember just telling one of the young ladies that I'm close to, I said, you know, the Lord has released me. And I know people have their ways uh, and their thoughts about this, that, and the other. However, this is for another day. But anyway, I began, I shared it with her and she said, no, I'm going to pray that you don't go. And I'm like, please don't pray that prayer over me because it's not God's desire that I stay here. I finished the course. I finished my assignment here. And now it's time for me to go. And I just bless God because see, God knows our end in the beginning. So what am I saying, pastor? I am saying, be mindful of people that are always trying to stop you from doing the things that God has already told you to do. There is not that they're not well, you know, well-meaning. I, I believe that I know it came from a genuineness in our heart, but the same way Jesus had to rebuke Peter, it wasn't for the glory of God. You were thinking because of our relationship, you're thinking because of the things here, but the Lord says, I have another assignment. And so we've got to be mindful. And then it goes on to talk about it. We all know the story when uh, Judas betrays Jesus. And I'm still talking about the zeal of Peter. Amen. I hope I didn't lose any of you. <laughs> and it talked about and why the enemy was trying to sift him. If he could just get to break his spirit. And it goes on to say that when in John 18 and 10 through 11, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it says, then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Melchus, M-A-L-C-H-U-S, the high priest slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into his sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the father has given me? In other words, because of his zealousness, he was going to try to protect Jesus. Now, if I cannot stop you from going, at least I can do is to fight for you on your way. Because see, Peter loved him that much. Peter was so determined. Remember the zeal said he wanted to please God so much. See, sometimes we can move too soon. Sometimes we can do so many things within our flesh to get the attention. He didn't need the attention. It was already settled when he told you, you are the rock. I've already told you who you are, Peter. But because of the love, because of the zeal, because of the enthusiasm, enthusiasm that he had and the eagerness to please God, he says, Jesus, if you won't stop, then I'm going to fight for you. And he said, mm -mm, put it up, put it up. I got this. This is a path I have to take. Some of you have to be dogmatic. This is a path I have to take. And God is with me. What the word say, if you want to reign with me, you got to suffer with me. I have to go this way. And so it goes on to say, and we all remember when he says, now, Peter, you said that you will be with me. You will even go to prison with me. You will even die with me. See, I love all of the examples that I gave as to why the sifting happened. But you remember when Jesus told him, and you can find that in John 21, 15 through 19. And it goes on to say that as he was being led to the cross, I'm going to read it. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, oh, this is the other one. Um, that is the purpose of the restoration. But we all know the story that as Jesus was being led, Peter did wind up denying him three times. And so I can only imagine how broken he was. But remember, Jesus had already said, I prayed for you. And so after the resurrection and he was coming or they went to the tomb to find him. I'm talking about the women when they all gathered and went to the tomb to see where they had laid him. And when they got there, the angel was sitting there and he was asking them, what are you looking for? He is not here. He has risen like he said. And so he told them, he said, now I want you to tell the disciples and Peter. <laughs> To meet me, I'm going ahead of them, but to meet me in Galilee. Isn't it amazing how the Lord, in the midst of his mess, because I believe Peter was broken. I believe Peter meant to do well with everything that is within him. And so do we, 
on different times, when we get hard pressed, when we're in the midst of the sifting, that we forget what man or person we are. We forget who we're supposed to be and who we're called to be. We get so caught up. And when he actually began to deny the very one he was willing to die for, when he denied the very one that he cut the ear off for, when he denied the very one that called him to walk on water, when he denied the very one that began to transform his life, when he denied the very one that he said, I will be with you, no matter where you go, I'm going to be right there. But to realize that what you said was true, that it really broke his heart. I believe, and it says that in some of the gospels that he just ran away. You know, you can't hide from God when you sin. I believe he ran away and he began to hide because I don't believe he was with the disciples because Jesus would have said it, but maybe he was singling them out because he knew that he was broken. Maybe he singled them out because he needed to let Peter know, I haven't changed my mind. I still love you. I told you you were gonna deny me, but I also told you that I pray that your faith don't fail. So all I need for you to know is to meet me in Galilee. All I need for you to know is that I'm going to transform you. I'm going to restore you. Your faith didn't fail because if you meet me there, I know that the love is still real because I already saw it written in the book of life. I already saw your name. I already know what you were going to do. So go get the disciples and tell Peter I'm going to be waiting on him. Go get Peter. Some of you, you're Peters. You've been running way because you think just because you're seeing that God isn't able to forgive and restore. He is. He's calling you back tonight. Go get Peter. Go get Beverly. Go get all of the ones that think I've just discarded them because of the slip up, because the pressure got a little bit hard, because they didn't know what manner of person they were. They had to be sifted. So when you go get them and you tell them I'm waiting on them, and it says that when Peter got back, this is what I love of God. He didn't rebuke him. <laughs> he didn't rebuke him. And so the scripture that I was talking about, John 21, 15 and 19, that's the restoration and the elevation of Peter. After the sifting, God restored him and he also elevated him. And it reads, this is the uh, new century version. And it reads, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Isn't it amazing? He said, do you love me more than these, the disciples <laughs> that stayed together, the ones that didn't deny him? But Jesus got God's, I'm sorry, hmm, Peter made an impact on Jesus because he knew his heart, but he also knew what was in his heart what was in the soul bed, that pride had to be broken, that he had to harness this zealousness that he had for God, that he had to just kind of temper him. Because anytime you see somebody getting ready to accost somebody, and the first thing you do is to pull out your knife and cut their ear off. He had to mold him and fashion him. So it was in the midst of the sifting that God was able to restore, to change, and allow every impurity that Peter had to fall off. And I'm going to drop down. And we all know the story. And Jesus asked him, he asked, Peter, do you love me? He said, more than these. And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. See, elevation. <laughs> Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter answered again, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep, shepherd. He's calling him to be a shepherd. He's calling him to be one that began to feed the lambs. In other words, uh, sincere milk of the word, begin to groom them, begin to care for them, begin to watch over them. And then he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt, it says, because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. In this whole situation or scenario, after the shifting, God brought about the forgiveness, repentance, and restoration. By asking Peter, do you love me more than these? Jesus is not inviting Peter to compare his love to that of the others, but rather 
he invites Peter to realize the weaknesses in his own love. He invites Peter to move from one place of pride to a place of humility. It's all about the sifting. And once you go through, God will restore and he will even move you from one level to the next or one from one place to another. It's by divine design that God has called you for such a time as this. Don't throw in the towel, embrace the sifting because after the sifting, there will be a shifting. Amen. I pray this word was a blessing to you. Now, all of those who don't know Jesus and the pardon of your sins, if you would just repeat after me, Father, I believe Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart because I know you died and on the third day rose again and now sits at the right hand of the Father. Take my life and take control. Amen. If you said that simple prayer, I want to say welcome to the kingdom. You're now a kingdom citizen. Now let's go forth and embrace the sifting because there is purpose in the sifting. Amen. I turn it over to our announcements. Like to sow into this movement and financially support the initiatives that we're doing at Global Apostolic Movement, we have five ways for you to do so. You can visit our website at www.gamovement.org to give by credit or debit card. We are on Cash App at dollar sign GA Movement. We are on PayPal and Zelle at our email address, gamovement21 at gmail.com. And also the Givelify app under Global Apostolic Movement. We also invite you to become a covenant partner of Global Apostolic Movement. We are a global movement for the 21st century saints. And for more information on how to become a covenant partner, please visit our website at www.gamovement.org. Click connect, then click covenant partners. Global Apostolic Movement has launched our outreach ministry and we invite you to join us as we seek to connect globally with those in need. If you are interested in supporting, please be on the lookout for information that will be posted on our social media pages. We thank you in advance for your assistance and helping us with our passion to help others. Our Chief Apostle LaShawn Reese is back with inspirational moments every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook Live, Instagram, and YouTube. You're invited to tune in and receive encouragement and motivation to help you make it through the week. We encourage you to invite others to experience inspirational moments. Cam is inviting men to join our men's group hosted and directed by our very own Elder Elisha Small every third Monday night at 8 p.m. This group is for men supporting men through encouragement and empowerment. These private meetings are for men only and is a secure place for men to discuss and ask questions. For login information, please look for the flyer posted on our social media pages. You can meet us back here next Sunday and every Sunday at 7 p.m. for our virtual church services. However you are tuning in now is the way that you can join next week. We are on the same Zoom meeting ID every week and Facebook Live at Global Apostolic Movement. Our very own Elder Phyllis Walker has transitioned to glory to be with our Father. Let's bow our heads for a moment of silence. And now for our benediction. What a word, what a word, what a word on tonight. Saints of God, I told you in the beginning that I came looking for a word and that is just what I received. I praise God for how the Lord has used Pastor Beverly Cole on tonight to bless our souls and to bless our hearts. Her topic for tonight was sifting comes before shifting. And I'm going to give you the scripture, saints of God, that she began to give us tonight so that you can take the time in your leisure and read these scriptures. She gave us Luke 22, 31 through 34, 
Luke 19, 18 through 25, Jeremiah 29 and 11, Matthew 16, 20 through 24, John 18, 10 through 11, and John 21, 15 through 19. The word of God was awesome, awesome, awesome on tonight, Pastor Beverly Cole. We thank God for you being obedient and letting the Holy Spirit use you. She began to tell us that a sifter means to take out the residue and that you have a zeal for God. When you got a zeal and a hunger and thirst for God, saints of God, B12 shots and the monster energy drink, they don't have nothing on God. We thank God for the shifting on tonight, which means to shake and move from one place to another. Glory to God. And she also began to let us know about John 21, 15 through 19 about restoration and elevation. We used to sing a song that said, elevate your mind, let's go higher. Elevate your thoughts, saints of God, and let's go higher. We thank God for the word of God on tonight, well spoken and well done, woman of God. I pray that each and every one of your souls and heart will truly touch and bless on tonight. Remember, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season, if you spank not, that ye shall reap. And now I'm going to give you the benediction because my whole heart and my soul, I am full on tonight for receiving just what God had to give to us. Glory to God. I told you I had my plate, my knife, my spoon, and my fork, saints of God. And I even had to run to the kitchen and go and get a bowl. I thank God for the word of God on tonight. Truly the word of God was a blessing. And now I'm going to give you the benediction because I don't want to prolong the time. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Saints of God, remember the sifting comes before the shifting because we are in the season of sifting. We thank God for each and one of you that have joined us on tonight. And we pray to God that we see you again next Sunday night at 7 p.m. We praise God for the word of God. You are all now dismissed. Be blessed and stay with God. Thank you, Jesus.